Kimberly Sherwood is now joining. Well, good well, evening, good evening to, to all of you all attending of you tonight's, tonight's, tonight's electronic board, board meeting. Board meeting. Both, of, both, of, <laughs> both those in the virtual attendance as well as the superintendent and the cabinet, cabinet and, board and board members, board members are, all are all attending from their phones. From their phones. We also know we also that we know have a number of net community, community members, members currently, currently joining us tonight, tonight, tonight as well. Thank you all Thank for, you being for being here. And I'm going to pause for a while. I'm very sorry to start this meeting in Gecko. I don't know if we can work we on can that. We can work on that. Testing? Testing? All right. All right. Oh, I'm still getting started. If you're not if you're muted, please mute. Please mute. mute. Great. It sounds like it might be working now. So again, thank you all for being here. And this meeting is now called to order. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Here. Mr. LaValle? Here. Mr. Lundberg? Here. Mrs. Reynolds? Here. Mr. Tenby? Here. Thank you, Ms. Adad. The Pledge of Allegiance tonight will be led by Mrs. King's kindergarten class from Va Mountain View Elementary School. Please join us for the pledge. Thank you. I don't know if the rest of you could hear that. I could not, but those children were terribly cute. So I said that in my head as we went along. Thank you so much. So we're going to move to item two, 
on the board agenda. And that's the approval of the agenda. Ms. Adad, are there any updates to the agenda? There were updates to the agenda and the board was notified of these. Thank you, Ms. Adad. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move from the consent agenda? Hearing none, are there any items to be added to the agenda? And again, hearing none, may we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Mr. Lavalley, are you muted? Yep. Yeah, I got it. I got it now. Second, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you both. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Mrs. Reynolds? Aye. Mr. Tenby? Aye. Moving on to the third agenda item is the board quote, and I'm going to hand that off to Mr. Tenby to talk about his quote this evening. Well, thank you, Mrs. Reynolds. Um, this is where I need Daniel Day Lewis to do a voiceover. Um, but <laughs> this is from Abraham Lincoln upon the subject of education. I can only say that I view it as the most important subject which we as a people may be engaged in. And um, our 16th president led us through a tumultuous period in history and valued being surrounded by well-educated and opinionated people. This is illuminated in one of my favorite books, Team of Rivals. Many historians say that five great takeaways from Lincoln that we can still use today are be a self learner, never stop reading, try something new, don't lose your sense of humor, and dare to be different. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tembe. On to agenda item number four, and that is public comments. Mrs. Cortez, do we have anyone signed up to speak to the board this evening? This evening, we have no one signed up for public comment. Thank you, Mrs. Cortez. Thank you. Going to move on to board comments, and I'm going to begin with Mr. Tembe. Great, thank you, Mrs. Reynolds. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, I really want to thank Mrs. Cloninger and Mrs. Reynolds uh, for quarterbacking our gifts to the principals and all the work that uh, Mrs. Cloninger put into the baskets, uh, delivered eight baskets this week. And uh, I know that every principal was uh, very appreciative of the uh, gifts. So thanks again to Mrs. Cloninger for her legwork on that. Um, and I would like to publicly uh, express my appreciation to uh, Tom Gregory and Allison Cortez for their representation of the district over the past several weeks. Uh, they truly have made lemons out of lemonade. And I think uh, District 20 has really reflected well in the media over the past uh, few weeks during these times. So I just want to express my appreciation. Uh, to both Mr. Gregory and Mrs. Cortez. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tembe. Mrs. Cloninger. Thank you. Um, I actually got to do all of my um, delivering today. Uh, I had my 15 year old out driving me around. It was nice to be chauffeured. He was bored with how many times I stopped, stopped and talked at the doors. Um, but it was nice to see all of the principals to catch up on what's going on on their schools. I got to do one drive by um, because Explorer was doing their teacher appreciation and invited me over to come. And so uh, Mrs. Driver and I exchanged gifts, which was sweet. <laughs> and uh, and then I also got to do a little reading for them. Um, and that will be published in their weekly email next week. And then whoever wins, we have a little contest going and whoever wins will get a little book delivery from me. But um, my point in saying all that is that I had um, an overwhelming sense of how hard our educators are trying to continue to make this as seamless as possible. And I know that you, you get into this business for the kids and for the passion that we have for um, teaching 
And it's so evident because these teachers and, and principals are so committed to their students. And um, I've just been so incredibly impressed with their attempts uh, to keep that going. So just following well, uh, kudos to um, the district, Tom and Allison, I agree. The coverage of things that have been good news stories and positive light have been really amazing. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cloninger. Colonel Harding. Colonel Harding, might you be muted? All right, I'm going to go on to Mr. Lavalley, please. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Uh, I just kind of echo what uh, Ms. Cloninger and, and Mr. Temby said. Thank you for putting those baskets together. It was kind of fun driving around and, and you know, seeing where our principals live, which was kind of interesting. We, we normally would, would never do that, but uh, they, not just the principals, but everybody in the district has done such a, a wonderful job in these very difficult times. We've got to start school in the fall in public, in person rather, and I sure hope we do that, but but everybody is doing the absolute best they can, and, and I just uh, hats off to everybody who's who's uh, been working so hard in these very difficult times. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Mr. Lundberg. Thank you. Uh, and the same, I'd like to thank Mrs. Cloninger and Mrs. Reynolds for the, the setting up the baskets and allowing us to go out. That was surprisingly fun, I, I, I found it. Guy, if you have the pictures done, could you do number one? I saw this picture on Facebook yesterday. And I just wanted to show folks a former board member, uh, Mr. Streeb and Mrs. Streeb. Uh, their daughter, Kamiko, had a uh, young man last year, and it was just such a cute picture. I I wanted to want everybody to see it. Number two, please. A couple of weeks ago, Mr. Lavalley and I went over to DCC, and we watched the the uh, lunch giveaway, so to speak. And we watched all the cars coming in, the lines of cars coming in. There were quite a few. Had a great time. Number two, please. We wanted to see exactly how they were packaged and done, and they came in a in a van like this. Number three. And Mr. Uh, Mario Romero, the principal of the middle school, was were there. Picture number three now. And Joe Girarchi, uh, assistant principal of the middle school, is there. And they were handing out the uh, the lunch bags, and I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. I, I was shocked to see how many people went there, and we just had a good time watching people and uh, seeing how things went. So it, it was a very good time with Mr. Elliot and myself. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lundberg. I think Colonel Harding found his way back in all the pleasures of technology. So Colonel Harding. Uh, nothing from me, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Carl Herning. Uh, you know, I'm going to repeat some things that some others have said as well, but I want to begin with a thank you uh, to teachers across District 20 during this Teacher Appreciation Week. You know, as they always do, they continue, even during this talent challenging time in this world, to work hard to give all of themselves to their students. Um, they serve so many students and they serve them so well. Since March 16th, they've had to rise to the call uh, to be flexible, innovative, accountable around instruction, and they have done just that. In addition, um, as I was reviewing all the communication that was coming from the district leadership team, and again, we'll go back to the thank yous that we heard for um, Ms. Cortez and, and Mr. Gregory, I, I marveled at the impact that this pandemic has had on educators and our families um, that they serve. We've heard about graduation attempts, attempts to honor our students who are graduating, our athletes, our seniors, our drama students, our kindergarten, fifth and eighth grade students aren't going to have those continuations like they're used to this year. Um, I've read about ensuring the safety of our essential staff members, and I've read about beginning to plan for next year. Those things are all happening behind the scenes, and I just so appreciate the efforts to, to celebrate our kids. It, it happens. Um, seems on the front lines rather flawlessly, but I know how much work is going into that. And so suffice it to say, I'm just simply humbled by the professionalism and advocacy of our superintendent, our cabinet, our department leaders, our department members, our principals and APs, our teachers and our support staff. 
Um, I captured everybody in those groups, but I want them to know that individually they're appreciated as well. Thank you for what you're all doing each day. And finally, I want to thank the board for their efforts to support our schools. Um, they shared a bit about taking out the baskets and I sure enjoyed that as well. It was fun. Um, we celebrated our teachers and principals this week. And also in addition, we as part of the Colorado Association of School Boards are doing all that we can to advocate for the federal and state legislators to understand the impact of budget decisions on the education of our children. And finally, on a good, very happy note, um, I was um, in my home today on a Zoom call with the uh, Colorado Department of Ed and my husband said, Karen, come out here quickly. And I caught the Antelope Trails Elementary School Parade coming past my home and I took some pictures and I didn't think ahead like Mr. Lundberg did to have them loaded, but I did give them to Mrs. Cortez um, for future use. But how great it was to see students and staff and their principal out there celebrating and honking and it was just a rather joyous time. So I get to wave at a lot of people and shout at them as they went by. So thank you Antelope Trails. Thank you to everyone for all that you do for our students, um, parents included. And I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Gregory for administration comments. Yes, thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Uh, I would uh, turn it over to Dr. Peak. Thank you, Mr. Gregory, and good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce two administrator uh, finalists. First is Joey Eisenhut, who is the recommended finalist for Director for Transportation. Joey holds a Bachelor of Science in computer science from Angelo State University in Texas, a Master of Arts in Business Management from Webster University in St. Louis, Missouri, and a Master of Science in Strategic Studies from the United States Army War College in Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. Joey served in the United States Air Force for over 20 years and retired as Colonel. He was commander of air mobility squadrons, chief of Homeland Defense divisions at the Pentagon, deputy commander for air mobility operations leading over 2000 personnel and senior advisor to commanding general joint force headquarters here in Colorado Springs. After retiring from the military, Joey served as the division disaster director for the mid Atlantic division for the American Red Cross. Most recently, Joey has served in Yokota Air Base in Japan as the Air Terminal Manager for the 730th Air Mobility Squadron. And next, I would like to uh, share with you, we have a recommended finalist of Shannon Slogger for the position of Special Education Administrator. Shannon holds a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville and a Master of Arts in Educational Leadership from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Shannon started her educational career in Texas teaching third and fifth grades. And upon moving to Colorado, she was hired by our very own Dr. Lujan Lindsay at Frontier Elementary School to teach special education. Currently, Shannon teaches special education at Academy Endeavor Elementary School. Thank you, Mr. Gregory, and thank you, board. Thanks, Dr. Peek. I have a few, uh, actually quite a few uh, announcements uh, recognizing our students and staff. First, Rampart Senior Stephen Astor, Juniors Caitlin Zager, Owen Reeves, Nicole Smith, and Jack Dixon and freshman Sydney Campney won the Colorado Broadcasters Association Future Broadcasters Award for their work in the KRAM Broadcast Journalism class. In addition, the KRAM class placed second in the Colorado Student Media Association Best of Show for general coverage of the COVID-19 in schools of more than 1,700 students and sixth place for general COVID-19 coverage. And as you know, um, seems like uh, every few months the KRAM folks are continuing to win uh, more awards. Three district students qualified for the 2020 International Science and Engineering Fair. Congratulations to DCC eighth graders Aditya Ganella and Gio Ragaraman for their projects A Hiker's Third Eye. There should be a photo and Run for Your Life. 
and congrats to the Pine Creek senior Stephen Lewis for his project, Cybersecurity Engineering for Aircraft. We're proud to announce the winners of the district's Earth Day poster contest. Congratulations to Air Academy's Maya Matal, Chinook Trail Middle School's Lauren Robinson, High Plains Satya Swain, and High Plains Liam Rupert. Under normal circumstances, as you may remember, the winning art become, becomes posters displayed at our schools. However, in our new COVID-19 reality, the winning artwork can be viewed at ASD20.org. Congratulations to all those students. In honor of Teacher Appreciation Week, the Colorado Springs Down Syndrome Association held a contest for families to nominate a teacher who is making a difference in the lives of their child. Two D20 educators won this award. Congrats to Carrie Call at Chinook Trail Middle School and Jamie Finn of Challenger Middle School. Thank you for helping our students. The Colorado National History Day competition was held last week. The competition only selects two projects per category to send to nationals. Three Liberty High School projects qualified. Congratulations to Brooke Gowan, who took second place for her performance of her original work, Barriers Broken Through an Engineering Marvel, the Panama Canal. Congratulations. Willison and Morgan Elmore, who took second place for their website titled A Neglected Revolutionary, How Youth Activist Claudette Colvin Inspired the, inspired the Infamous Actions of Rosa Parks. DCC teacher Jeremy Beckham was recognized by the National Speech and Debate Association for his exemplary volunteerism and leadership related to speech and debate. As a Colorado grade district committee member, he provides mentorship for speech and debate coaches, helps recruit new programs, organizes tournaments, and publicly recognizes the accomplishments of students. The Cabinet International Elementary School ESL teacher Karina Rates was featured in the Colorado Department of Education May edition of SPARK. When asked about her advice following the cancellation of in-person education, she advised ESL teachers to, and I quote, to be the missing link for their students and families, end quote. And lastly, I also want to recognize, acknowledge, and thank our staff during this week of appreciating our educators. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. It's pretty incredible how so many wonderful things continue to happen even when we are all at home. Um, so thank you for sharing all of those things. We're moving on to our fifth agenda item, consent agenda. We need a motion to approve the following resolutions. 15920, approval of matters relating to administrative staff licensed. 16020, approval of matters relating to administrative staff classified. 16120, approval of matters relating to staff specialists. 16220, approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. 16320, approval of matters relating to licensed staff, licensed support slash special services provider. 16420, approval of matters relating to classified staff. 16520, approval of student passing time 2020 2021. 16620, approval of engagement with the audit firm for financial audit of fiscal year 2019 2020. 16720, approval of appropriation of funds and contract award for partial roof replacements at Academy Endeavor Elementary School, Explorer Elementary School, and Rampart High School. And the approval of the Board of Education regular meeting minutes from April 16, 2020. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Mrs. Reynolds? Aye. Mr. Tempe? Aye. Thank you. We will bypass six because no items were pulled from the consent agenda. We'll move on to item number seven, which is our strategic planning update. I'm going to hand that over to Mr. Gregory. Yes, I would welcome Dr. Smith, please. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Gregory. I'd like to uh, welcome Ms. Kimberly Sherwood. Kimberly. Can we see Kimberly? She, might to, she, uh, is, she might have to unmute. I'm not sure if she knows she's muted on the phone. Kimberly, are you there? Mr. Reynolds, may uh, this this is Mr. Gregory. Can I may I suggest that we move on to the next agenda item and uh, we can work on getting her hooked back up while we uh, move on to the next item. Absolutely, Mr. Gregory. And again, I want to um, remind the audience, those of you who are watching, that um, I fail to thank you for your patience with our technology issues that might occur during these electronic meetings. So again, thank you. And Mr. Gre Gregory, yes, we will move on to um, item 7B, and that will be the diversity committee. Yes, and, and I hope Dr. Peak is with us. He can get us started here. Yes, Mr. Gregory and the board, um, I'm back with you all. Hopefully you can hear me OK. Yes. Terrific. Uh, well, good evening again, board and Mr. Gregory. We're pleased to share with you some information about our our diversity council uh, committee. Uh, we've we've yet to really officially name ourselves, but we've landed on council at this juncture that was uh, formed this year. Next slide, please. And I wanted just to share with you uh, my privilege of being joined this evening by three of my colleagues. Michelle Gunto, who is uh, at Mountain Ridge Middle School. She's an English language arts teacher. And Dr. Aaron Henderson, who is a consultant and also uh, works at Henderson EAP as a counselor. And Cynthia Jacquet, who is uh, a science teacher and department chair at Eagle View Middle School. So. Michelle and Aaron and Cynthia are with us this evening. I think I saw them on Teams. Next slide, please. So at the beginning of this past year in the 2019 fall, uh, actually it was probably late, late summer, early fall, Mr. Gregory and I engaged in some conversations shortly after he was named as superintendent about how we could improve our efforts to recruit and retain a more diverse staff in Academy District 20 and to consider strategies to promote a greater sense of belonging in the workplace. And shortly thereafter, I approached Dr. Henderson about co-facilitating a small group of some diverse District 20 teachers, administrators, and support staff from around these challenges. Dr. Henderson in particular um, has um, significant background in the areas of working with groups and individuals in diversity, equity, inclusion, and of course uh, just recently completed his doctoral research in social justice, also serving as a licensed counselor. So we work toward um, pulling together folks uh, for this purpose. And at the next slide, I'm gonna invite uh, uh, Michelle Gunto to share a few comments. Oh, thank you, Dr. Peek. Uh, so a little bit about the, uh, give us some background on the council um, and some numbers in the district. So we're approximately, our staff, 15% of our staff are, diverse where it's not matching our student population who are about 30 percent um, diverse and we want to not only change that ratio but make sure we equip all teachers uh, with the ability to engage with all students regardless of uh, racial or ethnic backgrounds next slide please so this work is important because uh, the Brookings Institute 
They conduct uh, in-depth research that leads to new ideas for solving problems facing society at all levels. Um, has found that um, minority students perform better on assessments. They have improved attendance and they are suspended less frequently when they have at least one same race teacher during their K-12 experience. Um, and all of these things, the performance and improved attendance, um, line up with what we strive for in D20 and being the peak of excellence. Next slide, please. So why else is this important? When we promote and what when we consistently promote welcoming and authentic inclusive cultures in every school and department, we can impact in a positive way the learning and working environments for every student um, and every staff. An inclusive culture is a culture that is committed to equity for all. And we know that equity is achieved when one's identity cannot predict the outcome and we want to be a district that is that that can say without a doubt that we we do that thank you thank you michelle uh, so good evening board uh, mr gregory and others in attendance uh, certainly grateful for this time to to share with you such important work um, so when we when i met with dr peak and we decided to form this uh, diversity council we were certainly committed to identifying a diverse group of D20 staff uh, to engage this work. And we were looking for diversity, in, in including those um, teachers, support staff, and administrators from across the district. We were also um, considered about diversity in, in terms of uh, cultural identities. And so we were looking to just capture the voices of, of folks from across the district, um, and that could, could speak to their personal experience um, and their living experience and, and share their voice in the same room. Next slide. And so those folks um, who are on uh, the Diversity Council are represented here in this slide. So you can see we have a, a very diverse group there. Next slide, please. To date, we have connected four times. And so those dates are reflected there um, on the slide. We have met um, several times throughout the semester. Our initial focus was to build trust and community with one another. One way to do that is we focus on community guidelines. And so um, I'm not gonna go through all the community guidelines that we reviewed each, each group, but they were um, outlined and we pulled from the work of Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington, uh, who runs the Social Justice Training Institute. And I've happened to um, sit with Dr. Jamie Washington. And so to give you an example, um, we wanted to create a space where folks um, not always felt comfortable, but rather felt brave and, and, and create a space where folks uh, felt like they could lean into the discomfort and share of their experience, uh, not only as they navigated their own lives, but um, specifically their experience working within Academy School District 20. And so um, we asked folks to uh, speak from their personal experience to give you an example. Um, and one way that we could do that is to use I statements uh, to share our own thoughts and feelings. So to give you an example, I, I identify as an African-American man, um, but my experience as an African African-American man within Academy School District 20 may not be reflective of other African-American men within the district. And so one way that I can honor my own experience as well as the others is to use I statements. Um, we also encourage each other to take risks, to lean into the discomfort, to be brave and to find our own learning edges. And so uh, I trust that we are able to to do that more and more as we continue to meet throughout the semester um, and, and most recently in May, May 1st of 2020. Next slide, please. Initially, when Dr. Uh, Peek and I met, uh, we were very intentional about how could we uh, perform, uh, set, set together a, a strategy so that we could uh, have a strategic plan in place to capture the experiences of, of staff, our diverse staff, as we move forward. And so one of the things that I appreciate most about Dr. Peak is he's very intentional about his work and he offered a systems framework in order for us to do that. And so um, we started with sharing our own experiences. Um, and so we, we um, met in small groups and, and engaged in large group discussions where we shared our, our experiences of what our time has been so far in Academy School District 20. Um, and then we talked about 
um, in the very next group, what would be our ideal experiences? And so if resources were unlimited, time was unlimited, um, what, what would we like to see happen in terms of creating an ideal workplace for all uh, cultural identities to be represented and respected within the district? And so that's where we are at now. Um, we plan to move forward and, and talk more intentionally about um, the barriers that might exist um, and then move into a discussion about what we could do as a district um, collectively, individually about overcoming those barriers. And if we are able to do that, what might be uh, the payoff? Next slide, please. And I will turn this over to my colleague, Cynthia. Thank you, uh, Dr. Henderson. Earlier this year, while our group was engaged in this work, the Colorado Department of Education invited district teams to apply to participate in a professional learning series that provided opportunities to reflect upon past and present manifestations of racism and inequity in policies and practices in the United States. This training explored issues of equity through the lens of race with the goal of supporting leaders to create policies that ensure equity for all teachers and students. This learning series cons consisted of three all day sessions. April 3rd was canceled due to COVID, where teams were asked to examine the roots of racism as well as the current day manifestations in government and education policies and practice. The sessions were facilitated by the Gemini Group, a Colorado based organization dedicated to helping groups achieve not only a greater understanding of the foundation and dynamics of racial equity, but more importantly, how to implement equity to reduce disparities in communities and improve outcomes for all residents. Next slide, please. So as a team, we gleaned big ideas which provided a multi-pronged framework for us to proceed. We first considered the question of why people stay and accepted the simple answer of wanting to belong. So the first big idea was acknowledging that forward movement to equity requires commitment to developing a comprehensive district strategic plan, revisiting mission, vision and mission as supported by the board and the superintendent. We'll continue working with the Diversity Council in order to create and sustain momentum to ensure equitable outcomes. In terms of professional learning, we need to create buy-in supporting, supporting our um, different professionals within the district by providing professional development and training. Uh, examples could be identifying implicit bias, both on a personal as well as institutional levels, and strategies to create cultural responsiveness in the classroom. We must also look at policies and practices. It must be examined through the lens of equity to identify institutional and systemic biases, always keeping the end in mind. Next is communication and media. How is District 20 depicted in our communication and media? Commercial ads and even district or school websites. Do the images, language, and opportunities demonstrate cultural, racial, and ethnic understanding? And if not, then what are we going to do about it? Next is recruiting pipelines. Studies have shown students succeed in environments where they're represented among the staff. So we need to consider where are we recruiting as well as um, what can we offer applicants of color that would demonstrate that we are an inclusive environment? And lastly, we must develop community and business partnerships as well as with our parents. Um, we realize that we are in a rich environment, a rich community where we have experts of all kind across all different cultural and ethnic and racial divides. So to bring them into the fold in the decision making in as well as the evolution of this process. Next slide, please. Thank you, Cynthia, and also Michelle and Aaron. We would just close with sharing with the board and Dr. <clears throat> and Mr. Gregory briefly that our group is committed, as mentioned earlier, to our work into next year, including a focus on continuing with our systems framework, which will allow us to identify and prioritize actionable goals. And we're excited, of course, um, tangentially of the work that hopefully will be uh, further shared this evening again that Dr. Smith and Ms. Cortez and others are working toward with our strategic efforts. Uh, we also, and I'm pleased uh, as a member of that group, as a side note, that uh, the components around diversity uh, have been uh, one of the themes. Uh, we also recognize that for this meaningful 
a change uh, to occur and to address our um, our purpose in a deeper way. It needs to involve more than just a handful of folks coming together periodically during the school year. So we'll of course be looking for meaningful ways to uh, connect and engage with others as we continue. And we'd like to uh, have a few moments right now if there might be any questions or anything that we could share or respond uh, to the board this evening. Thank you, Dr. Peek. Um, I'm going to um, turn this over to the board, but great report. Thank you. Um, Mr. Temby, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, yes, thank you, Mrs. Reynolds. Um, first of all, I want to uh, applaud this initiative. I was struck by the Brookings Institute uh, research and the comment about the success of minority students and uh, people of color and um, this entire uh, area of focus. Uh, when there is a person of like background uh, uh, during their K through 12 education. I think that's that is extremely meaningful. What is also meaningful is the alignment of this to our strategic plan. This needs to be part of our core moving forward as this uh, district grows. This district is going to become more diverse, and so I'm very excited by this initiative. Uh, just a question to the group. Um, how has this pandemic and our remote environment uh, affected your work um, in terms of convening and sometimes having very intimate discussions uh, about uh, this uh, issue? Uh, I'll, I'll certainly defer to the group, but maybe just one brief comment. We we were finally, I think I'll say finally, and, and mostly I, I would guess predicated on our teaching schedules and, and my schedule. Um, and I know Dr. Henderson's schedule with EAP has been exceedingly busy, but we were delighted to reconvene uh, on the 1st of May, uh, but we do recognize moving forward that I think we will have to be uh, becoming more savvy with Microsoft uh, Teams and or Zoom. But uh, Michelle or Aaron or Cynthia, any further comments? I would I would 100% agree. Um, I think definitely at first initially it put a, a halt in the work and, and certainly with the work that we were doing with the uh, the Gemini group, as Cynthia mentioned, um, there were several cancellations there. And so um, that was disappointing, but there's certainly momentum. And we've even talked about um, getting together and, you know, if nothing else, kind of getting reinvigorated by doing some um, internal studies, some book clubs, and just restarting the, the conversation. So there's there's been some awesome momentum here in the last uh, couple of weeks. Great. Thanks, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Tempe. Mrs. Cloninger. Thank you, um, Dr. Peek. You know my feelings about this um, group, I think, because I um, have talked to you several times about my favorite book called Waking Up White. <clears throat> I think that um, you're definitely on the right. Like uh, Mr. Tempe said, I think that it's um, hugely important and and living in in Colorado, I feel you know I used to live back east in Baltimore, and and the idea that this is a diverse place is um, <laughs> it, it, I don't think that it is. I agree that it's becoming more, um, but I love the um, just that understanding that kids that um, are in school need to see someone of their own race, you know, uh, modeling for them. And I adore that. I think that is such a vital, um, it, vitally important thing for our our school district. So I am completely behind you. I would do anything for this group and support you however I can. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cloninger. Colonel Harding. Just a, a question slash comment, and I don't know if it would be appropriate given the, the purpose of the group is more centered around recruitment, retention, and workplace. 
but I, I wonder if you've contemplated having any student representatives. Um, like I say, it might not be appropriate to the purpose, but it would be perhaps a visual demonstration to the student body of the district's commitment towards this effort. And then uh, my second question was, what can the board do to help? Uh, great uh, comment questions, uh, Colonel, and I would be remiss not to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Dr. Field and Learning Services and Professional Learning and their efforts around culturally responsive classrooms and many of the strategies that they have been working with adults to engage with students as a side uh, piece um, to other efforts in the district. Uh, we have yet to really engage with kids being a part of this, not, not out of an exclusion per perspective, but more in the sense of, again, initially starting with uh, um, the purpose of what can we do to better retain and recruit uh, from the adult perspective, but but duly noted and something that uh, also I think to uh, my comments that we know this will need to be more than just even our small group uh, to expand and to permeate in a in a, a more widespread manner than than just a, a few folks coming together. Um, uh, I, I'll I'll let others share or respond as well about students or, or certainly or if they've got a ideas about board support. I, I think uh, just the board's not just acknowledgement, but but support that this is important work uh, excites me uh, greatly. Um, and and that I've got these wonderful colleagues that in in uh, friendships, quite frankly, that I'm developing with folks on this group, um, their their passion and commitment it seems like we're just getting started and uh, COVID unfortunately kind of put a little bit of a slowdown, but I, I would say just even the board's acknowledgement and support and also the excitement, as I mentioned, about the the work coming with uh, our strategic uh, plan as a district and the fact that just naturally on its own through the stakeholders that uh, diversity was an element, a, a theme that came out. And I know that again, Dr. Smith and others will speak more to that in the future. Michelle or Cynthia, uh, either of you or Aaron have other thoughts? Um, this is Michelle. And as far as how the board can help, I can't say, but I want to say that as a as a black woman working in this district, I appreciate first Dr. Peak for and uh, Mr. Gregory assembling this group and and then the board support. It's not often being a minority that your job comes to you and says, "Hey, we want to make sure that you feel uh, as a part of just a part of this body as her group of organization um, as everyone else." So I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And this is Cynthia and I want to um, sign on right next to Michelle and agree with everything that she stated. For obvious reasons, this is something that we're very passionate about and um, this is our walk and to have our district being willing to walk beside us and listen to us is absolutely empowering. And one of the things that, you know, we've just discussed um, within our council group is, you know, we're on the front lines and we see where the gaps are. And so having a district that validates our observations and validates our concerns is gratifying because that gives us the initiative to move forward. And, and I know within the group, we've discussed reaching out to students and giving them opportunities, whether as part of this group or having their own affinity groups, but definitely giving them a voice and an opportunity to, to change the change the sculpture that um, the, the culture that would support them and, and all students in whatever um, advantages or disadvantages that they come with um, culturally, ethnically, even physically. Um, you know, we want inclusive to be more than just the new buzzword. We want it to be demonstrated in, in, in every possible way within the district. Thank you Great, all thank for you. that. Um, Colonel Harding, was that was that an over and out? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I appreciate okay. the feedback and just yeah, I'm pretty excited by this actually. Great, thank you, Mr. Lavalley. 
Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Thank you all. I, I would say your last names, but I, I fear I may butcher them. So if I may just say Michelle, Aaron, and Cynthia, uh, thank you. Um, I, I do have a few, and they're going to sound pointed questions. And forgive me, I, I'm just I just want to understand. So when we talk about diversity, for instance, probably 80 to 85 percent of our elementary teachers are female. Um, that's not a diverse group. Ideally, we'd have half of the male and half of the female. Is that something that you all are looking at? Is that an example of of a non-diverse, if you will, problem that we're trying to address? Well, I would say, Mr. Lavalley, that I think we're thinking globally across the the full spectrum of the adults who work with our students, and it may not. Uh, we we haven't set out with this work, I guess, at this juncture to target any one particular group or exam uh, as an example. So we're thinking um, more broad strokes in terms of how do we increase um, uh, more opportunities for students to have those kinds of experiences, especially for our students who are of minority. That understand. So my sense is that and again, this is not a, a criticism at all. That, that when we talk about diversity, we're talking about only racial and ethnic diversity. Is that is that the case? Is that the scope that you guys have limited yourselves to? We have we have not limited ourselves to race and ethnicity, although that has been a piece that we have engaged in probably more with. But we are entering into this work really looking broad based about uh, having in, uh, and supporting and promoting uh, an environment that is inclusive for for um, for individuals and um, that it's welcoming and that that all people can feel that they are a part. And Dr. so, uh, yes, yeah. sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Greger. I don't want to cut you off. I can't see you, so it's hard. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add to it. I guess the maybe the the origins of you know how this how this got on the radar screen. Uh, this fall or late summer uh, may be important to this and the word's been used several times, but um, I, I was talking to actually it was a former board member and then Dr. Peak and what I learned uh, and was most disappointed it with uh, was less on the attract side, although that's that's still a that's that's still an issue uh, and a challenge, but I was most disappointed to hear about retention. Um, and the question is, why do especially um, people of color leave our school district? And specifically, and more than anything else, we're probably talking about teachers, uh, at least in my mind, that's what it was. And what, what caught my attention was, um, one, that, that we were struggling to retain after we worked so hard to attract. And then more so than that is, is the why. And it was not for financial reasons, uh, I mean, that may be part of it, um, but it was for this this feeling of of uh, never uh, the sense of never feeling belonging or included. Um, that's what was most disappointing to me. So I, I guess I would answer your question, Mr. Lavalley. Uh, the origins of this were really centered around, you know, why is it that that some folks, regardless of of race, ethnicity, height, hair color, male, female, whatever it is. Why is it that we have some folks uh, and some folks with similarities that do not feel uh, included after being in the district for, you know, uh, some of them up to three or four years. So it wasn't like it, it was a six month trial and, and they decided to leave. It was three, four, five or sometimes more years uh, and in that entire time never felt like they belonged or included. So the question was, is there something we can do about that? And that, that's when uh, you know, Dr. Peak uh, had spoke to Dr. Henderson and, and we started to go down this path. So uh, the origins of it were about belonging and inclusion. Uh, so wherever that expands to, if in fact at the elementary level we have uh, male teachers who don't feel included or that they belong, uh, they would certainly be part of this. But uh, that would be my way of explaining, you know, what this is really about. It's it's really about uh, anybody that we hire 
if they're good good teachers, we want them in, in front of kids. And at the same time, we want them to feel like they're a part of the school, they belong there, and they're included. And I, I say over at that time. <laughs> yeah. Roger, over. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. I, I can fully support that. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Heaven forbid we hire uh, a, a minority and they and they feel out of place. They feel like they are not fully accepted. Shame on us if, if that in fact happens. And I and I, I fully support that. I, I just want to make sure that that we stick. You know, we are, that there's guardrails that we, that we're careful what, what what we mean by diversity. That that can be a double edged sword now in our culture, sadly. And I just I want to make sure um, I have one more. This seems almost a two part thing. One is once we have them right, do they do does do all teachers, do all principals, do all staff feel um, accepted? And and that's very important. The other one is is and we talked about it briefly is is hiring. Um, do we do we uh, do we do affirmative action in our hiring or do we do it colorblind? Do we? I think it's great that we go seek out and look for those minorities that we can in that diverse group, but my hope is we hire the best, period. Yeah, uh, good good questions and, and um, Mr. Lavalle, and just a couple of thoughts. One, back to what Mr. Gregory said, and, and this really resonated with those of us who participated with the CDE um, training by the Gemini group. Retention really, uh, does need to be the primary focus when when we can put efforts in intentional efforts, uh, systemic efforts around belonging and welcoming for all that um, arguably is uh, could be argued the best recruiting tool, i.e. think of just any type of basic referral in other industries, right? You know, you should hire, you know, Joe down the street because he he, you know, worked on my house and he did a he did a great job. I, I mean, analogous to that, I've had conversations with with Michelle. I, Michelle, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you you shared a compelling um, comments with me uh, earlier this year about just having conversation with a colleague. Um, who uh, also identifies as Michelle identifies in another school district. And I'm paraphrasing, but I, the takeaway was, well, why would you want to be up north in District 20? And um, so even our recruitment efforts um, uh, will be intentional, but I think the big piece to focus on is what are we doing to change from the, uh, in, in work toward that, um, even more um, welcoming environment, and 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 when we do um, find folks that that they they will be with us. Um, you asked another part. I just forgot now, Mr. Lavalle. I apologize. What was the other piece of your question? Well, thank you, Dr. Peak. That that helps a lot. I I couldn't agree more. We want to be the kind of place where everybody says this is where you want to work. Um, and I couldn't agree. I, I was and the, the other part, top. which we already talked about, was was the once we, you know, now we have these teachers administrators. What can we do to make sure that they feel accepted, yeah. part of the, part of the community? And, and and I think that's been adequately answered. One last question. I, I was a little surprised, and I forget. I don't know what slide. I guess it's slide number ten, and it's the professional learning opportunity. It says investigating systemic racism. Does anybody feel like there's systemic racism in D20? I, 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 I'm a white male. I sure hope we don't. Um, I, I mean, are there individuals that are that are racist? Of course, you can never get rid of that. But but I sure hope that there is not systemic racism in our district. Well, uh, I I would share I would share in your hope, Mr. Lavalle. But I I think as we continue to learn and examine our practices and our policies. We may very well identify with things that were not ill intended, but uh, through through widening of our lens and, and deeper understanding, uh, we may recognize that there are are different or improved ways by which we can um, have um, particular policies or practices. 
that that would move away from some of those things that may be in place. So I, I couldn't point to a single component, but I I could not stand before you this evening and express to you that we do not have some practices that could be argued as um, uh, systemically uh, racist or 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 somehow um, impeding on a more welcoming and, and inclusive environment. And I think that's part of the courage that this group has and is prepared to engage in conversation and to examine and to broaden um, further discussion. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Lavelli. Mr. Lundberg. Well, no, no questions exactly, just a comment or two. Uh, my hat's off to the, the group. The, it's fantastic. It's a, it's a much needed group. I looked at the, the people that are in it. They are fantastic. And under the leadership of uh, Michelle, Aaron, Cynthia, I think we're going to do good things. I'm very pleased about this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Lundberg. Um, so it's to me now, and I, as I was reading this, I, I almost wrote everything that I'm going to say right now to Dr. Peek, and then I remembered I get to talk to you tonight. Um, so first of all, I want to just tell you I love this work. Um, as you know, this has been a passion of mine for a long time. And yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And we, we go back to the Superintendent's Diversity Communication Council um, about six years ago now. And um, what we learned during that time, although that, that council went away, what we learned during that time was exactly what's happening here. And that is that we need to begin with the teachers and begin with those um, people who can be role models for our students. And Dr. Peek, I'm just so happy to see this work going forward. And Mr. Gergi, thank you for doing that. Um, it's it, it warmed my heart. I, I have to tell you too, when I was sitting in a meeting at uh, Colorado Department of Ed this fall, um, we were talking about the Gemini work and the work that was going to happen around this. And um, I we had the list of people who had applied to be a part of this and D20 was right up at the top of it. And again, my heart swelled and I heard somebody very similar to, and I believe you just shared it, Dr. Peek, uh, say, really, why D20? And I said, well, why not? There's just an incredibly proactive group that cares about people and I'm not surprised that they're there. So thank you for that. That that felt really good to be able to see that and to see that you're one of the first to apply and be a part of that, that work. Um, it was very positive from CD's perspective as well. They just were impressed because it's that that mentality people have of well that's that northern colorado springs district and they don't get it i think we're getting it um slowly but surely um i also wanted to just affirm that this alignment with the strategic plan i think is pretty incredible i love that we have that understanding that when we open access to teachers we open access to our kids and that's hard, the hardest thing for our, uh, minority kids sometimes are high risk kid, any kids any kids who don't know how to access a curriculum they need role models who who can help them access that and we make that happen when we give access to teachers so um i, I dr peak dr henderson Ms. Jaquette, and uh miss guinto and i was going to use first names too because i knew i would mess them up but thank you for your presentation this evening and it's very clear that uh, again, one of the many things that Dr. Peek is good at is finding excellent people to fill positions, and it's clear that he did that with tonight's presenters. So that's a long way of saying thank you very much. Um, appreciate the work, and we, as the others have said, support it um, because the reality is we all have unconscious biases and we all need to be better prepared to uh, face them head on. So thank you all for your thank presentation. You. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds and the board. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Mr. Reynolds, before we get off the topic, I just want to, first of all, thank uh, all three folks um, for for giving us time uh, tonight. Cynthia, Michelle, and, and I'm sorry, Aaron, but uh, I, I struggle with the Dr. Henderson part. So the background <laughs> on, on Dr. Henderson, so that the board knows, is uh, no disrespect, by the way, Dr. Henderson. But, thank, uh, thanks, Coach. <laughs> uh, this, yes, that's what I thought. Uh, Aaron, as I know him, uh, is a proud, uh, at least we're proud, I hope he is, uh, is a proud graduate of, of District 20, uh, graduated from Rampart High School, and uh, actually uh, works as a, a as a professional outside the school district, but is also an employee of the school district 
uh, as he continues to coach um, football for one of our high schools. So thank you to all three. Uh, Aaron, know that we're, Dr. Henderson, know that we're really proud of you and we're so glad that you're a part of this, of this work that we're doing in District 20. Thank you, Mr. Gregory slash coach and for the role that you've had throughout my life. And you know I love you, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank um, you. On, on, yes, thank you, Dr. Peek. And on that note, I'm going to move back to um, item 7A. I believe we have our presenter for our strategic planning update, Mr. Gregory. Yes, we'll try. Uh, Dr. Smith, is Try introducing Kimberly again and see if we're ready to go. Yes, thank you, Mr. Gregory, and, and great job, Dr. Peak. And I have to say, happy birthday to you. And uh, but as we move thank on, thank you. Here, <laughs> um, please welcome Kimberly Sherwood, who's working and and leading uh, much of our strategic planning process. All right, can everybody hear me? You are good. Yes. Yep. Oh yay. <laughs> I, I, I imagine I am not unique in this, working in multiple virtual environments and becoming a student of many different platforms. Uh, so thank you all so much, um, uh, uh, members of the Board of Education, for once again inviting me back. And uh, to just give you a quick update, and it will be quick. Um, so next slide, please. Next slide. All right, well, I'll just go ahead and, and uh, begin speaking. And this really dovetails um, so elegantly uh, with the um, uh, perspective that was just shared by colleagues working on uh, the diversity and inclusion part of the district. And so this is a reminder of where, where we are in our, our project right now. And um, up next, we're really going to be, we're preparing our strategic planning committee um, like uh, the, the diversity group. Um, some a fairly significant disruption and adaptation has been required and so we have migrated the group to meeting virtually and we'll be meeting in a series of meetings over the course of the next six weeks uh, virtually and with an eye uh, and fingers crossed um, and, and hopeful hearts that we will be able to meet in person for our, our real retreat work. Um, however, uh, I uh, I do want to let you board members know that um, in our company this last month, we did have the opportunity to uh, prototype and test working virtually over a series of sessions very discreetly so uh, to develop a vision framework for another client. So if it comes down to it and we have to do it virtually, uh, we feel pretty confident that we can accomplish the objectives. Um, of course, our, our you know, gold seal is to be in person with um, all of the, the wonderful people on our planning committee. But just as a backup, we have prototyped this and we've evaluated it with uh, feedback from the clients uh, individually to uh, affirm and also learn <laughs> what worked and what didn't. Uh, but we, we've really received some very resounding positive comments about uh, the way in which we were able to really engage the group effectively using uh, various modalities of these uh, virtual platforms. So just as a reminder, um, what we'll be focused on, and you can see in the spring 2020 bubble, are these really important uh, statements, the mission, the values, and the vision. And that that will inform the strategy uh, as we go forward. I want to say just a little bit about strategy for a moment, and that is that the, the key activator for strategy is not goals, um, and it's not objectives, and it's not tactics. It is culture. And so hearing um, your colleagues this evening talk about creating or nurturing or stimulating or strengthening, whatever that verb is, a culture that is welcoming and authentic is really stirring for us as your planning partners, 
Um, it nests perfectly within the work that we are doing uh, with the Strategic Planning Committee. Uh, the colleagues on the phone this evening also mentioned courage. And uh, courage is one of the seven guideposts that we use when we're working with groups, and it will absolutely be part of uh, the framing for helpful ways to work together when we get our planning committee really diving into developing or refining mission, values, and vision. I also appreciate the power of a systems framework. And what I want to say about that is that when we really look at culture, there are three elements that actually make it work. Behaviors, systems, and practices. And so we can have a glorious strategic plan, we can have a multitude of fantastic ideas, but if we don't have a culture that actually supports the implementation of those ideas, um, that uh, are really connected and guided by uh, the values uh, that we uh, ascribe to ourselves, uh, the strategy will fail. So I am really, really excited to have had the opportunity to hear the presentation just before this, and I do think that there's a little bit of providence in uh, the tech difficulties so that um, I had the benefit of hearing about this important work. And so just thinking a little bit about uh, culture and how that really activates strategy and the context of behavior systems and practices, there are a few things that I just want to offer extemporaneously. And this really has to do with the leadership. And so uh, one of the board colleagues this evening asked, what, what is the opportunity for the board? And um, this might be more of um, an ethos. Uh, than it is a directive, but people really do see what leaders do. And if leaders aren't exhibiting behaviors that reflect the values, then the values are meaningless. And so as we step forward into the second circle, the 2020 to 2021, it'll be really important that we are looking for ways to operationalize the values uh, to create clear expectations of how we will behave as an organization. Because that is really where culture gets activated and that then supports the strategy. The second piece of this is really how we work with systems. And so I'm really excited about the systems framework. And you all have already pointed to one of the most important pieces of this, and it's hiring. The second component is strategy and goal setting. So whether you knew it or not, as a district, you brought an alchemy to this work. And it is really just, I, I can't tell you how excited I am about what's going to be emerging as a result of this confluence of good work that you all have invested in. Under the systems, we also then look at important things like assessment, which you all are really good at, developing and investing in developing our staff and our, uh, our teaching, uh, teaching folks, and our reward systems. So uh, this goes to what Mr. Lavalley was talking about, that importance of retention so that we can really focus on that nourishing and enriching student experience. And then finally, really looking at practices that help support our culture and help support then our strategy and our ability to be effective. And part of that is having repeatable, effective decision-making processes. So there's a lot that goes into really making a plan sing and come to life. And I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but I just really wanted to take a moment to both acknowledge and express my deep appreciation for the work that uh, this district has invested in so far and seeing the natural braiding of these processes coming together is terrifically exciting. Next slide, please. So we've updated our timeline to reflect the uh, disruption. And um, so we're doing vision preparation, virtual planning sessions, April and May. Um, 
the current state report uh, Board of Ed members, you'll recall we talked to you about just ever so briefly uh, in March, and that will be coming to you in final form uh, in late May. We'll be reviewing it one more time as we did go back to the drawing board and do some more in-depth investigation in certain areas. And uh, so you should be expecting that um, in uh, the late latter part of this month. Uh, toward the end of May, we'll then be working on our pre-retreat visioning work, and we've been really sensitive to how much work we can actually assign to our strategic planning committee, but they will be, uh, out of next week's meeting, which is on the 12th, they will be receiving briefing materials and pre a preparation packets so that they can do some individual reflective work prior to our our retreat, which we're, we're planning on holding in June, and we're hoping that we can do it in person, but we will do it virtually if need be. And then uh, we've had to shift our timeline a little bit, as you can imagine, just due to this disruption. And so we'll be vetting the concept of the vision framework come June, July, and then really moving our sites toward that 2021, starting to do the more in-depth strategy work as we go forward. Next slide, please. So just as a reminder, our visioning retreat is going to be broken into two parts. Day one is going to be focused on mission and values, and this is really where we will rely on the collective wisdom of our strategic planning committee. Um, some of the folks who are doing the diversity work are also engaged in that committee, so we've got a nice overlap. And uh, we've got some other representatives working on other important uh, initiatives um, ignited by Dr. Gregory. Um, they too will focus on envisioning the future and really bringing the framework all together. And so that's what we've got planned at this point. And uh, I'll be looking forward to coming back in early June with more uh, updates and feedback on how, uh, how our virtual process is working with our 50-member planning team. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to be with you. And if you have any questions, I'm all ears. Thank you, Ms. Sherwood. Uh, Mr. Tempe, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, yes, Mr. Reynolds, thanks. Uh, Kimberly, eloquent as always. Um, so, uh, with the advent of the great work of the Diversity Council and our pandemic, how do you weave in um, agility into the process to make sure that it's looking at things comprehensively? Obviously, our attention on remote learning um, <laughs> has been accelerated greatly, um, which uh, is a factor. Uh, in the district, uh, district now and uh, could be in the future. Um, we've seen the growth of the village high school and people looking at an alternative way uh, to get their education. Um, so how do you weave that into the process um, uh, to make sure that we're looking at all the variables? Um, because uh, we need to be agile now. And so uh, just a question for you kind of from a macro standpoint. Yeah, it's such a it's such a good 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 question. So you'll recall that you know part of the purpose of the current state report is to clarify for ourselves the where we are right now as a district and uh, the externalities that are potentially creating pressure. There there are things outside of our control, but uh, could be really important. And I I'm will not be surprised, Mr. Tembe, if we get some feedback uh, from the committee next week that might encourage us to perhaps do a little bit more of a, a, a for lack of a better term, analysis uh, as best we can on uh, where things might be going. We've been paying a lot of attention to the literature, and I may have mentioned this to you, but um, the, the resources that we really have found most helpful 
our uh, Harvard Business Review, McKinsey, uh, and Deloitte to a certain extent, uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review, and all of these organizations, uh, and I'm sure you all are paying attention to them too, are pointing to what we need to be thinking about with regard to education. So in our predispositioning materials that will be going to our committee members, we are uh, offering several resources for folks to be reading. Um, because at the end of the day, this group uh, has to be able to own the ideas that are going to be, that they are generating. They've got to be able to sort of have the starch in the backbone to commit to the ideas, to commit to this envisioned future. I think the idea of agility is essential. And the place where I think it could get most uh, significantly activated is as we step into 2021, 20, the, this next year, uh, really, and we begin to look at how are we going to take these ideas and really begin to move them out over the course of the next three to four years, uh, it, really bringing an agile lens to them, uh, I think could be very important. I would expect that that's probably going to be elevated by the group, but it's also something that we can absolutely weave in um, as part of our preparation for the team and as part of our follow-on as we begin to turn our sights toward implementation, which will be the lion's share of the focus for 2021. Great, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Absolutely, you bet. Thank you, Mr. Tempe. Mrs. Cloninger. Hey, Kimberly. Um, I appreciate the position that you are in, uh, that the two of you are in, as far as being the kind of outsiders looking in, so to speak. Um, and I think I've said this before from the dais when we've been in person, but I appreciate that there are so many things about D20 and about this uh, culture that we do have that is good and is and is functional. But I also appreciate straight shooting and no, you know, no glossing over of the things that we need to be better at. And so I would say, bring that on because I would love to hear that in the reports as far as, you know, where those kind of changes are coming. And I hope I'm making sense with that, but I just feel like I love the raw piece of that. Not to not to make people uncomfortable, but I think that's where we grow. So I encourage that is all I'm saying. And I recognize and and can appreciate your your very fine line that you have to walk. Uh, but I do appreciate also the fact that I think we have some really great things in place, but I, I do recognize the whole point of having this committee is to find ways we can grow. Yeah, and I would just say the spirit of it, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. The spirit that I've seen with this group, and uh, it's not that we, we haven't spent a ton of time with them, and of course, you know, the the disruption has made that um, all all the more challenging, and and it's hard when you can't see people, right? When we can't see each other in the eyes, and and uh, when we can't feel the heat of our physical selves being in the same space together, uh, when we can't hear that laughter. You know, this this is a little bit more uh, two dimensional than it is three dimensional. Um, this, these virtual platforms. Um, but uh, yeah, it, in my experience, and uh, I think uh, your board chair could speak to this uh, as well as a member of the committee, uh, the group really doesn't hold back. Um, they are, uh, I think, um, feel emboldened. Um, and you know, what I'm always looking out for is um, the danger of the petty grievance. and. Uh, getting caught in things that are not strategic or that are not going to really be uh, particularly useful, but might be the thing that, you know, people love to grind an ax about. And so, you know, going back to our uh, conversation last month and the point analysis really elevated the critical importance of clarity and alignment 
the critical importance of organizational health uh, and culture inclusive of diversity and the fundamental importance of the student experience. And so I, I expect that um, we'll, we'll get a lot of good candor uh, from the group and the, and the way that we approach the facilitation. So there's the report part, of course, the current state report. And, and Debbie has done an excellent job of that. And as you know, she doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't really hold back. Uh, mm -hmm. But we do try to, to balance candor with diplomacy. Uh, so that uh, the recommendations and the suggestions and the findings can actually be uh, received. And you're right, it is a fine line. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, what, what we discovered when we were working with the group and reviewing the current state report and the feedback is that uh, people want, they were as rigorous as Debbie was uh, in saying, we need to understand this part a little bit more. We need you to clarify what you mean by this. And so I just feel like, um, and I don't want to sound like a cheerleader, you know, like, oh, you guys are awesome and just keep rocking on with your bad selves. The spirit of this project that we've uh, embraced from the beginning is one of um, uh, openness, candor, being kind, uh, but absolutely rigorous and disciplined. And I feel like we're, we've got a partnership with our committee and agreements with our small planning team with Dr. Smith and Mrs. Cortez to really hold ourselves accountable to, uh, to that spirit uh, that you're pointing to that I think is really important. I appreciate that. I, I want to just say this. Um, I appreciate that when you get into a group of people that you can get into some of the you know um go down a rabbit hole as far as a grievance or something that may be more trivial or or one-sided um and i and i appreciate that and i and but i also know that when we get into some of those committees it starts to sound like yes committees and and i and so i appreciate you giving the the highlights to us again it's because we can't see your face we can't you know engage like we would in person <laughs> but it's one of those things where um kind of you know from the sideline i I, lo I love hearing that that is the discussion that's going on so anyway a great job i appreciate it yeah and let me just say one more thing so i think that you all uh i i can't recall if we shared this with you or not but let me just reiterate our approach to facilitation uh we really are steeped in the technology of participation, which has been pioneered by the Institute for Cultural Affairs. The Institute for Cultural Affairs is in Chicago, and uh, they are an organization uh, committed to the people of the planet finding ways to create their future together. And the methodologies that we use for facilitation are built on uh, four ways that humans process information. And it really is about creating opportunities for people to express themselves for diverse points of view, uh, and then to bring a conversation to its natural conclusion. So it, 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 it is somewhat organic in that there's room in there for people to grapple and thrash and debate. Uh, but we're, as your facilitators and your planning team, we're always trying to move a conversation to its natural conclusion. And just this last week, I experienced this profoundly with a group where when we opened up, there was a lot of um, dissonance among among the folks on the on the call and as we facilitated the conversation people became clearer in understanding everyone's unique point of view and we were getting ready to wrap things up and move the conversation to the next phase and one of the board members said to another board member hey first name you mentioned that you had this issue which had been elevated like 40 minutes prior in the conversation. And so did we answer that question for you? And the other board member had the foresight, but I would have facilitated if she had not, uh, to say, I, 
my consciousness has moved. My mind has been changed. I understand now where the authors were coming from. I've moved on. I can live with where we're going. And so that's the power of this approach is allowing and really honoring the various ways that people process information in group settings to, as best we can, sort of allow for a little bit of rabbit holing, but not so much. And so that's the, the sort of more creative artistic part of this process. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. You bet. Colonel Harding, do you have any comments or questions? No, nothing that hasn't been covered. Thank you. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you, Colonel Harding. Uh, Mr. LaValle. Thank you, Ms. Sherwood, and thank you for all the members on the committee. I have no questions. Mr. Lundberg. Thank you, everyone, for all the work that you put in. No questions. Thank you. And I would just simply add that um, I have appreciated the work as I am the board member that sits on that committee as well. And um, I have to say, for one, I understand uh, Ms. Cloninger's point, of course, about voices being heard. I also appreciate uh, Ms. Sherwood's response about the danger of a petty grievance. I wrote that down, actually, because I really like that. Because as a facilitator, I know that can absolutely sway a whole group from a big decision that needs to be made or a conversation that's on target. So um, I appreciated that and your your reference to the critical importance of clarity and not just hearing one agenda. It's a fine balance. We need to do both, but we need to have a group move forward so we don't lose that group, uh, that group momentum either. So thank you for balancing all of that for us and um, thank you for your presentation. I'm looking forward to continued work with you. Thank you all so much, and thanks for your patience as we figured out the tech. It's all right. We understand. Thank you so much. Bet. And I'm going to move on to item 7C on our agenda, our end of year planning. Mr. Gregory. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Uh, so I, I, I think I need to first address, you know, why, why, why is this on an agenda? It's not a, it's very atypical for something like this to be on the board's agenda. Uh, so let me just explain that we've, you know, information uh, has been uh, not a, not because of anybody's fault, but just naturally uh, in our environment kind of piecemealed. You know, there's a piece that comes out uh, in an email from a principal or a piece that comes from me in a, a non board meeting format. Uh, what I wanted to do is take this opportunity to just kind of recap a little bit of what's happened this spring uh, and where we're at uh, with many of the end of year activities, planning, uh, and we'll talk a little briefly Kimberly about Sherwood a couple is items now exiting. For, for next year. Goodbye. Um, the what part, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so several of these topics uh, you already know about, but I, I really wanted to take the opportunity to uh, in a public setting, make sure our community also uh, hears, uh, if you will, from the horse's mouth on on many of these things, because uh, some of them are still being questioned. Uh, it's certainly not an all inclusive list, uh, but I think it is important for tonight and I'm happy to ask any questions at, at the end. But so first, uh, as you know, many traditional end of year activities and events, especially for seniors, have been canceled. Proms, breakfasts, lunches, award ceremonies will not be uh, occurring, at least as they have been in the past, uh, and will probably not be rescheduled, most likely not be rescheduled. Uh, however, schools uh, are being very creative, or at least trying to be very creative within our parameters, uh, and are conducting award ceremonies through various means, uh, most of them virtual. Uh, and I was informed today by uh, one of our principals that uh, Tom prompts uh, although they've been canceled, they are happening. Uh, and I guess this is through social media, but there are many little proms happening out there in people's basements and living rooms and uh, those, those kinds of means. So uh, kids and families are being creative also. Most of our theater productions and choir shows have been canceled. Uh, there are some very creative workarounds that have been devised. Uh, and one of those you saw uh, as an example, and it was the Liberty Choir. I think I sent you a link uh, to see what the Liberty Choir instructor did in a virtual environment. The spring sports season was suspended 
uh, originally on March 13th. And then on April 21st, it was canceled. So the whole spring sports season was canceled. All practices uh, and or gatherings of athletic teams are suspended until June 1st. Summer athletic, summer athletic activities, um, and even I shouldn't just restrict that to athletics, but summer activities have not been canceled, but at this time can only occur under existing parameters. And as you know, those parameters are you can't have more than 10 folks participating, including instructors or coaches. Uh, physical distancing must be in place. There can be no physical contact. Uh, face coverings are required. Uh, folks in a, in a vulnerable category uh, should not participate. Uh, proper personal hygiene is, uh, I'll say, required, although we can't control that. Uh, and so on and so on. So it does make it difficult to have uh, activities happen in the summer and we'll make adjustments as some of these parameters may loosen over time. The continuations, uh, so that's not graduations, but continuations, traditional continuations for fifth graders at our elementary schools will not occur as they have in the past. Elementary schools, however, are planning a variety of celebrations for their fifth graders uh, to include things like uh, handing out yard signs, neighborhood parades, kiss and go drive through celebrations, videos and virtual ceremonies. Traditional continuations for eighth grade uh, have also been canceled, but again, schools and principals are doing some very creative virtual continuations and recognitions. With regard to graduations, um, this is a long story, but uh, as of today, in fact, this morning we did submit, I submitted our plans for graduation for the nine District 20 high schools, including TCA and TCA College Pathways. Uh, we submitted plans for in-person graduations. It would be graduates only, but in-person graduations for five of the seven non-charter schools. That would be Air Academy, Discovery Canyon, Liberty, Pine Creek, and Rampart, uh, Aspen Valley, and the Village due to size or small graduating classes have chosen to do their graduations uh, virtually. The two TCA high schools are requesting in-person ceremonies, uh, but their plan includes, uh, best can just be described as a drive-through format where uh, graduates will not get out of their cars or mix with other graduates uh, and family members can attend, but they're all in their car and uh, it's kind of a fun little format they've got set up. Uh, and if you're familiar with their campus, it has that circle drive in front of it. So it appears to me like they're going to be making multiple trips around that circle drive as a part of this graduation. Uh, students, uh, excuse me, as you may have read, so the kind of the context or background for this, uh, but as you may have read, El Paso County Board of County Commissioners approved a variance request for the graduation, high school graduations in El Paso County. And either have or will submit that request uh, for a variance to the governor for approval. If the request is approved, now that's an, it's a very important if, if the request is approved, then El Paso County Public Health has the authority to approve high school graduations in El Paso County that do fall within the uh, established and approved parameters. So what I mean by that is when the Board of County Commissioners uh, approved the waiver request to send to the state. Uh, that request included uh, a list of uh, parameters for graduations. Uh, in order for graduations to occur, they have to fall within those parameters. And probably the most significant of those is that it's graduates only. Really modeled after um, what the Air Force Academy uh, conducted. Uh, I don't know of a timeline. I have not heard a timeline. In fact, I don't think anybody at the county knows exactly what the timeline will be for the state acting, either approving or denying the county's request. Uh, but it is the first one, uh, it's the first request for variance submitted by El Paso County. And listening to the Board of County Commissioners the other day um, when they met, um, I believe they are expected, they expect to submit several other variance uh, requests to the state. So bottom line is with graduations, we, the dates are still uh, what the dates are. So we're still looking at the, the week of the 22nd of June, uh, but we don't still know if they're going to include uh, in-person ceremonies or virtual. 
And at this point, I would say that it uh, hinges upon uh, the state approving El Paso County's request. So that's where we are with with graduations. Ms. Reynolds? Mr. Gregory, can I interrupt you for a second? Thank sure. you. Um, could you clarify real quickly, and perhaps I misunderstood, um, TCA's um, suggestion for their graduation, has that been approved yet, or is that also part of this waiver request that has gone forward? All right, what we decided to do with Mr. Sojourner at, or Dr. Sojourner at uh, TCA, was instead of TCA submitting their request uh, separate from ours, they were included in our in our proposal. So we've submitted right. ours to El Paso County and TCA is included in that. So no, they right. have not been approved. They will be right. approved or, or denied, I guess, or modified along with the other high schools sure. in District 20. Does that answer Thank the question? You. It absolutely does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, regarding summer school, all elementary summer school courses have been canceled. Uh, middle school and high school courses that can be delivered virtually uh, will continue to be offered. Uh, and the reason, if you can make the connection there, the reason that the elementary courses are not going to be offered is essentially because of the restrictions. If, if it doesn't make sense to happen or they can't be delivered virtually, then uh, obviously it's very difficult to offer the courses. That also eliminates many of the summer school opportunities that were um, I'll say outdoors, such things as um, a summer band generally happens outside. There are several outdoor activities. Um, I'll call them outdoor learning activities uh, that can't happen uh, because you can't guarantee uh, all of the, that we can fall within or abide by all the parameters. The school year uh, and instruction, as you know, the last day of school is uh, scheduled for May 29th, I shouldn't even say it that way, will be May 29th. Uh, however, due to all of the parameters, phys uh, physical distancing and other uh, COVID requirements, the last day of instruction uh, will be prior to May 29th. Uh, for, in order for students to return materials and equipment and to retrieve their personal belongings, i.e. locker cleaning outs, those kinds of things, and comply with all of the guidelines, uh, a multiple day process uh, is, is necessary. And each of the schools has developed a process. Uh, they vary a little bit, but in general, I think that's it's accurate to describe most of them as uh, kind of a drive-through. I can give you Eagle View as an example. Uh, Mr. Lester has uh, saved the students from cleaning out their lockers and staff has gone through and cleaned out the lockers and put all of the belongings in a bag and uh, anything else that belongs to a particular student. And as students uh, and their parents drive through the drop-off lane, we'll call it, uh, they'll receive a bag or they can get out of the car and pick up their bag uh, or it'll be placed in their trunk. There's many different ways to do it, uh, but that's how the students will retrieve their belongings. And at the same time, they will return uh, any of the belongings that they have at home to the school. And as you can imagine, with you know, either that format and then also complying with uh, not having too many folks on campus at the same time for our, our middle schools and high schools, uh, that's going to take multiple days. And for the high schools, I think they have scheduled a full week. So with that, some of the, and we're not talking about seniors. This is everybody but 12th, uh, except for seniors. Some of them will end the instructional year uh, more than a week prior to May 29th. And I think as early as some of them are as early as May 18th. So we're getting real near the end of, of the instructional year uh, within the next week or so. Extended school year, if you're not familiar with extended school year, sometimes referred to as ESY. Um, it, it applies to certain, I'll, I'll say certain special needs students if a team of uh, professionals has this determined that a student is in need of an extended school year for uh, meeting FAPE or their educational requirements, then uh, that's exactly what happens. The school year is extended for them. And at this time, preschool extended school year uh, will happen May 26th through May 29th. And for the rest of the school districts, so K through 12, the extended school year will take place June 8th through the 25th. However, uh, as you can imagine, social distancing still uh, applies. 
So due to those restrictions, there are a couple uh, offerings that will not happen this summer uh, just because they, they can't um, uh, in the current environment. With regard to budget, uh, as you may have read lately uh, and I have updated you lately, this situation seems to, again, it's projection, but it seems to continually get worse. Um, it's consumed a lot of time uh, over the last week or so and will continue to uh, consume time, but uh, I want to recognize uh, Ms. Allen and her staff for doing an uh, incredible amount of work uh, and trying to get this budget put together uh, in a short timeline. With new and changing information almost daily, we, we do our best to keep up. The situation appears to be substantial at this point uh, and nothing that I have seen in my career of 29 years, and that includes the Great Recession. So I think the last time Ms. Allen spoke to you formally, uh, we were working on uh, a small percentage uh, reduction in funding, uh, which is basically means flat funding from this year to next year. We have now pivoted and are trying to create a budget for next year that represents a 10% reduction. Uh, and we're being warned that it could be worse than that. So what does 10% mean to District 20? Well, it certainly is more uh, more than just a trimming of expenditures. In fact, the dollar amounts of 10% is $16 million. Uh, as you saw, hopefully you had a chance to see the budget memo that was sent out to staff earlier today. Uh, it is not an easy task to remove $16 million of expenditures. Uh, I gave some examples in that memo of, uh, you know, what entire programs cost uh, and multiple multiple of those would would have to go away to reach 16 million dollars one thing that we are uh, and i know there was an update on this earlier today uh, but we are asking for clarity and and mr lavalley and mr timby heard this earlier today in the audit committee meeting but we are asking clarity with regard to the use of uh, tabor funds the tabor reserve uh, i believe that we will be able to use, it sounds like we'll be able to use, um, or we hope to be able to use some of the Tabor funds uh, to help offset, at least in the short term, um, some of this $16 million. And just to give some relativity uh, to it, and in, this is in no way a political statement, it's practical and real. I, I really struggle with suggesting uh, some cuts, especially to uh, salaries, benefits, uh, staffing levels, all of those kinds of things. When we have a six and a half million dollar Tabor reserve that we can never, um, never, never have access to. So I think instead of uh, what I'll say overcutting or doing severe damage to uh, the mission of the school district, uh, I would much rather use a portion of the Tabor reserve to uh, essentially buy us some time than to uh, cut expenditures so drastically that it it really does hurt people in their lives, uh, and uh, e even if it is for a short period of time. So, as you know, Ms. Allen will present the proposed budget um, next next meeting, uh, and you'll see at that time and have a chance to weigh in. It's not for approval. It's the it's your kind of your first first see at the whole package that we're still working on but uh, it'll be your chance to see that that whole package and then just to review the timeline quickly. Uh, the May 21st meeting, uh, you will hear the proposed or initial budget. Uh, then the plan is that the first meeting in June, there would be a, a hearing on that budget, a chance for a community to weigh in on the budget. And then uh, the second meeting in June would be the adoption of the budget. So don't feel like uh, since you're hearing this for the first time, maybe on May 21st, uh, that there's no chance to do anything about it. That's the process is that that's that's kind of when you hear it. The last time we talked uh, in works uh, in a work session, uh, you heard all of our assumptions. Well, almost all of them have changed since then. So uh, the, the whole situation has has been modified. You may have any questions about about that. That's a big topic, and you're going to hear a lot about it in the news and media. So. Uh, while Ms. Allen and I are here tonight, I would love to to hear if you have any questions. And 
And I would just invite board members to speak as you need to uh, to ask questions if you have them. Sure. Um, this is uh, this is Will. Um, uh, Tom, thanks for the um, aggregation of all the information and some additional granular information just about as the conclusion of the year and and potentially what we face uh, heading into the beginning of the year. Um, one, I do appreciate the proactivity that uh, you, uh, Mrs. Allen and uh, Ms. Allen and uh, her staff uh, are taking right now. Um, these are um, these are concerning times um, because we want to avoid cutting into bone marrow along the way, um, and it's so hard to make decisions. I mean, I, I read the article about what the uh, JBC and what the legislature is uh, looking at and uh, how they're going to really impact a lot of lives along the way, and we're no different. And so um, uh, I appreciate your sense of gravity about the situation and, uh, you know, we'll, we, we share that. And so, um, um, you know, we'll stay tuned to look at iterations of, um, of numbers and where we go, but uh, yeah, it, we do understand the gravity of it. So, so thanks for uh, uh, leading right now. Yes, sir. Ms. Cloninger, do you have anything you want to add? I've said enough. <laughs> Thank you. Colonel Harding, would you like to say anything to Mr. Gregory? No, just that I was afraid of the, the uh, percentage cuts we talked about last time would get worse and sometimes I, I like to be wrong and this is one of those times but I wasn't so that's mm -hmm. all I've got thank you indeed thank you Colonel Harding Mr. LaValle yeah thanks Mr. Reynolds uh Mr. Gregor I have a quick question I think I know the answer money is fungible um I'm thinking the difference between using our table reserve versus our I forget the name of it extra money the one difference I can see it yeah, yeah, cap reserve. One difference I can see is is we make very little interest on our money on their Tabor account versus our cap reserve. So it, it would make sense to spend money, the money that you're not making much money on. But is there is that the only reason? Is there another reason why it's advantageous, if we can, to use that uh, Tabor reserve money? That's a good question. Uh, and Ms. Allen can correct me if I'm wrong, but the the interest earnings on all of our reserves are pretty much the same. Uh, there may be a, a slight difference between the, the fixed amounts, uh, the fixed yields and the variable yields, but uh, the primary reason is that uh, Tabor is, you know, we've we've held a Tabor reserve since 1992. Uh, haven't spent a penny of it uh, or even tried to access it over the over those years uh, because there was never really a reason. Uh, our argument, so it's very restrictive, right? First of all, you don't generally have access to it. Um, and in this case, uh, we argue that we do have access to it. The governor has declared uh, a state of emergency. Well, if the, the governor declares a state of emergency, that allows uh, access to it. Uh, if we weren't to do it this way, and let's just say instead of using Tabor reserve monies, we use the unassigned reserve uh, monies uh, and and next year or the year after that, we have to do this again, except for that Colorado is no longer in a state of emergency at that mm -hmm. time. We would not have access to those table reserves. So in talking to Ms. Allen, I think we agree that while we have access to them, uh, it is a good idea to uh, access them. Uh, knowing that there's another piece of this that uh, if they're used, uh, it's it's not like, you know, it doesn't create uh, a secondary issue, and that is they, they do need to be replaced at the 3% level uh, at some point. And at, at this time, that point is 36 months. Uh, but there's also alternatives to that. And as you heard uh, Mr. Niedermuehler say today that there are other ways that you can meet the Tabor Reserve uh, without using cash. Uh, you can use you know other assets, physical assets, fixed assets like buildings to meet that requirement too. So there's other options there. Uh, but really, I would say, Mr. Lavalley, it's while we have the chance to, uh, I think we need to. Well, that would be my recommendation, at least. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Mr. Lundberg. 
That's that's awful. This is, this is like bobbing for apples, you know. Go for the red one. I I've got so many questions. I think I'll just be quiet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely understand that, Mr. Lundberg. Um, just um, know that this is. It's not going to surprise anybody statewide. I've been on many. Oh, Zoom and team meetings with people from CASB and other board members, and it's it's pretty grave out there for a lot of folks. And um, it's really all about what can we do for kids. And again, I appreciate the focus that that's that you have, Mr. Gregory. It always is. How can we do this right for kids? So thank you for sharing all of that. And well, and understand um, too, this was just a, this was the primer, right? This was the sure. kind of the primer on it. There'll be far more discussion at the next at the next sure. meeting about this. Uh, and just a little bit on timeline. Um, you know, we, we the proposed budget or the initial budget will be proposed uh, or presented to the board on on May 21st. Um, the school finance act nor the state's budget is expected to be uh, approved and signed by the governor until very late in May or even early June. So, uh, you know, that things could still change even after we present the budget. But uh, I don't want to. I don't want to disparage a budget, but it is a budget and it can be changed uh, as we need to change it, even as we get into next year or even if it has to wait till the, the mid year time frame. But uh, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and finish up. I have a few others and, sure. and then I can take other questions. So Summer Institute, and if you remember Summer Institute uh, is the professional learning program for staff members uh, for all intents and purposes, Summer Institute is also canceled. Uh, there will be courses offered that are required for license renewal, uh, including uh, courses that uh, have to do with CLDE and induction. So they're the things that are like significant, most significant, and can be delivered either in an online format or in a really small group setting. Uh, learning Services, TOSAs, the teachers in Learning Services, are currently meeting with IT to determine the best way to provide teachers with knowledge and training they may need if we continue in a virtual environment in the fall. And that's an important one. And I, and I can't remember who, um, but um, somebody I think tonight or today uh, talked about if we return next fall uh, in the same distance or e-learning environment that we're in now, I think our community has, uh, has been uh, has, has offered us some grace uh, this this spring. There's been some really great things happen uh, that we know we can do better. And I think our parents and our students know that we can do better. And I think the expectation uh, if we return in the fall uh, will be much greater than it has been uh, this spring. So what that last statement I made means, the last statement I made means is that we, uh, we may need to spend some significant time this summer uh, helping teachers who are uncomfortable or unfamiliar with uh, teaching in an online or an e-learning environment uh, offer them some help and and feeling more comfortable uh, and more expert with with that form of, of instruction uh, next topic is the all staff rally in august uh, we're not certain if that event can occur as it always has in the past unfortunately uh, we don't know we're still planning for a live in-person event at this point. Uh, however, you know, reality might suggest that, that a virtual event uh, is maybe more likely, but we are planning to still have the live event. Um, but for something like that, we would probably have to get permission or approval from the county uh, health department. And I just, unless the restrictions loosen quite a bit, I can't see a comfort level at the county level with gathering a couple thousand adults uh, in a gymnasium uh, to hold a to hold the rally like we always have in the past. So more to come on that, I guess. But know that we are are thinking about it, planning for it, and then uh, returning to school in the fall. We could talk for a long time about this, but as Miss Reynolds said earlier, uh, we have started discussions regarding starting the, the school year in August. Uh, we have a framework that will guide our work and has potential to be used on a regional basis. So uh, we could, you know, get with other school districts and talk about what everybody in the region is doing. Uh, what makes this really difficult is uh, you're shooting, shooting at something that doesn't exist. In other words, there's no target to shoot for yet. Uh, are we 
what what are the requirements going to be in August, or what is the expectation? When are we going to find out? Uh, it's really hard to hard to design a an educational system that's very different than what we're used to when we don't know what that system uh, what what it needs to meet, what the requirements are. So things like you know, are there going to be physical distancing requirements? Are our face coverings going to be required? What about cleaning and disinfecting? Uh, what about gathering limitations uh, and how does that impact uh, our scheduling of the school day, the school week or the school year? Uh, many, many questions around that, but we are starting to have those discussions. As you know, PSAT and SAT were canceled this past spring as announced uh, in April. Um, at the DAC assessment update, CD is working with the College Board to provide an optional SAT and PSAT school day for administration this fall. Uh, but now there may be, I think there's funding questions about everything. And if that's going to cost the uh, state additional dollars, uh, this is a, I'm just saying this as a possibility. Nobody's told me this, but I've got to think that, that that's going to, that's going to compete for dollars in the state's budget. Uh, and maybe or maybe not that it happens. As you know, the Hall of Excellence um, spotlight was canceled. Uh, and we we're looking to reschedule that in the fall of 2020. The retirement banquet has been canceled uh, and Allison is holding four different dates in September uh, to possibly use as rescheduled dates. Um, but I would uh, just throw this out there um, uh, as a budget question uh, to be discussed later, but uh, that's a question. The years of service a spotlight uh, was also canceled and this has been rescheduled <laughs> originally. Uh, our bright plan was to reschedule the years of service award uh, to coincide or be part of the all staff rally in August where these folks could be recognized for their years of service in front of all of their peers. Uh, well, as you just heard, we're not sure about the all staff rally in August now, so uh, it's like dominoes falling. Uh, and then as you know, there's many state waivers that have been approved. I'm not going to go through them all, but uh, most significantly of those was the CMAS testing that was canceled this spring which also is going to have implications for uh, performance and accountability uh, ratings uh, that we usually get in the fall. Uh, I can't imagine that there's going to be any performance or accountability um, for next year because there is no testing to base them, them upon. And many of the READ Act requirements have been relaxed for this spring also. And I think for now I'll, I'll end there. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, students and staff have missed out on this spring. Uh, and it's, it's highly unfortunate, especially I, I feel every day for the for the senior class who not only have, you know, their their tr traditional year end of year events uh, been canceled or significantly modified, um, but also their you know the last the, all, all the kids that were participating in spring sports or worked really hard through uh, the winter on. Uh, you know, there's their spring musicals or their spring choir concerts and none of them ever happened. Uh, it's really disappointing for those students. Uh, and lastly, I would say that we talked a little bit about budget and we'll talk more about budget at the next meeting. But but know that um, we are lucky to be us, I'll say. Will it hurt? Absolutely. Uh, it'll take us multiple years to recover from it uh, from just this one year. Uh, if, it, if the cuts happen for multiple years, it just extends the problem out for several years. Um, but that said, uh, we are fortunate to be who we are and where we are uh, with our financial position. And we have we have more flexibilities than uh, many other school districts do. I would say that anytime we're talking about significant uh, reductions like this, revenue reductions like this, uh, that the larger you are, the more flexibilities you have, who really gets hurt by these kinds of things are the small uh, and mostly rural school districts uh, that we've talked about in the past as examples, but these, they don't have the flexibilities. Uh, they, they, there's just not room to go to make significant cuts in like 10% or higher. Uh, so fortunate that uh, we're in District 20 and that we do have some flexibilities and uh, the sun will rise the next day and we will all be in a good place. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. That's the end of my comments. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Um, Mr. Timmy, do you have anything you'd like to 
ask or say? No, nothing further. Thank you. Mrs. Conninger. I'm good, thank you. Colonel Harding. No, thank you. Mr. Lavalley. No, thank you. Mr. Lundberg. No, thank you. Great, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gregory. And it's so hard when I can't see the board to see what they want to say, so I have to go through the round robin. But thank you, Mr. Gregory, for sharing all of that. It's very insightful. And thank you for your efforts. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm going to move on to um, agenda item number eight. And I first of all would like to thank, we had about 10 audience members this evening. We don't have them any longer, but at one point we had up to 10 people attending. So thank you um, to those of you who have stuck with us and those of you who did attend as well. Um, I would like to remind the board members that we're going to be doing a road cleanup on May 16th at 10 o'clock. We've had to cancel so many times. Uh, but we will do that, and of course, unless it snows or something. Um, we will meet at our usual location as there's parking available there. I do have vests, gloves, and trash bags provided by Miss Adad. I do not have face masks, so please wear yours and know that we will be at least six feet apart as we complete our, our road cleanup. Um, if there's any questions about that, please let me know or ask them now. So anybody have any questions about the cleanup? All right, um, also before we close this evening, I would like to offer birthday greetings to the following members of cabinet and the board. Um, no cards to pass out this evening, but um, Heather Cloninger, happy birthday on May 5th. Just come and gone. Thank you. Happy birthday. Yes, um, if I were there, I'd make you all sing, you know, so you're in luck tonight. <laughs> uh, Brian Grady, May 6th, that was yesterday. Happy birthday, Brian. And David Peake, as you know, has a birthday today. Um, his colleague, Dr. Smith, has pointed that out to us already. So happy birthday to all three of you, and I'm sorry that we cannot be together. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. You're welcome. Okay, now our closing question of the evening. Was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success. I know that the board members are all nodding. That's what always happens. Um, and if not, they would speak up. So thank you all for being here this evening. Have a great evening. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. And to all, good night.